So welcome everyone to the Pi Entrepreneurship Speaker Series. And today we are very lucky to have Professor Yeo Groshka Cocaine from University of Virginia here with us to speak about project planning and management. So I will um, introduce Professor. Professor Yeo Groshka Cocaine is Altex Dislinger Foundation Bicentennial Professor of Business Administration and Senior Associate Dean for Professional Degree Programs at the Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. Her research and teaching activities focus on decision analysis, data science, business analytics, forecasting, forecast aggregation and the wisdom of crowds, project management and behavioral decision making. Professor Grashua Cocaine is an award-winning teacher and in 2014 was named one of 21 thought leader professors in data science. At Darden, she teaches courses on decision analysis, project management and data science in business. Her Fundamentals of Project Planning and Management Coursera MOOC had over 200,000 enrolled across 200 countries worldwide. While visiting Harvard Business School, she taught the required technology and operations management course and an elective course on applied business analytics. She has also been teaching in the Harvard Business Analytics program powered by 2U since 2018. Before starting her academic career, she worked in San Francisco as a marketing director of an ERP company. As an expert in the areas of decision analysis and critical thinking, project management, and digital transformation, Professor Groshka Cocaine has served as a consultant to international firms in the ad tech, aerospace, and pharma industries, such as Merck Serono, Pfizer, Eli Lilly, 2U, High Speed 2 Rail, PPL Electric Utilities, Heathrow, Airport and Eurocontrol, Network Rail UK, and the Department for Transport UK, and Dunlop Aerospace. She is an associate editor at Manage Management Science, Operation Research, and Decision Analysis. Next, before we get started, my co-host will talk about the logistics of today's talk. Hey everyone, I'm Raylan Piao. So before we get started, <laughs> we would like to go over how our Q&A section will be facilitated today. If you have any questions during the talk, please type your question into the Q&A chat box and Professor Greshka Cocaine will answer the questions during our Q&A section at the end. So please send your questions in. Now everyone, please welcome our professor. <laughs> thank you so much guys and thank you for that great introduction. Um, I am very excited to be here today. Can everybody hear me okay? Hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Um, can people type in the chat? Is that an option or is that not, is that enabled for folks if they wanted to type in the chat? Um, I think they can only type in Q&A. In a no Q&A. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. That's good to, for me to know. So I know what to ask and how uh, to engage folks. Um, so I am here to talk about project planning and, and project management, uh, an area that is near and dear to my heart. I'm going to try and focus my comments on entrepreneurs and why it's especially uh, important for entrepreneurs to get some basic idea around how to plan uh, and execute projects because uh, it's really just up to them to do the job and to get everything done. Um, I like to teach in an interactive way. So I can't see you guys, but I can see your names. Um, I can't see your faces, but I can see that you're atten attending here today. And I have the Q&A window open. So I would love to encourage you throughout the, call the talk um, to please ask me questions and we can do it dynamically. You don't have to wait until the end. Uh, stop me and say, you know, type in, can you go back or do, can you, can I ask a clarifying question? I want to make sure that um, this is an opportunity for everybody here to ask questions. And if you're still curious after the session and you have even more questions, feel free to reach out. I'll post, I'll share the slides. You can have my email address and we can find ways to get you any answer that you need to help you with your project management skills. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, um, hopefully you'll see that I'm very passionate about this area and I'll tell you how I got into it um, and I'll make it sure that it's relevant to you all. So I'm gonna share my slides. Hopefully you'll see those in a moment. Okay, I'm sharing my slides. I can see your faces. I can see the Q&A and I can see the chat. So I have everything in front of me. So there's no uh, way for me to miss any comments that you all make. Okay, so project management. Um, you know enough about me. I'm not gonna introduce myself any further, um, it, but it is important for me to, to let you know that I've been doing project management for years and years and years. 
Um, I've gotten, I got into it um, probably towards the end of my high school years. Um, I did a few years in the military before I went into university, um, and I really fell in love with project management. I like planning. I like thinking about um, projects that I have in front of me, and there's a lot of really cool techniques and tools that allow you to be even better. And so all of my research and all of my teaching for the past 20 years has really focused in this area. And um, I'm always looking for new opportunities to work with individuals who are doing exciting things in project management, and it's an area that is always evolving. So there's a lot, uh, a lot of exciting research here. I'm going to try and make this uh, talk more practical, so tools that are useful for you. I'm going to talk about my research a little bit less, but I will mention it. And again, if you're interested in reading up more about any of that, uh, feel free to reach out. So what is a project? Who is involved with a project? Um, I suspect most of you are involved in certain projects. Uh, um, Wendy, I know that I can ask you because you do have the ability to, uh, to use your voice. Let me give an, let's give an example, Wendy, from your life. Can you give us an example of a project that you're involved in? Um, I'm involved in, um, of course, this organization, this one. And um, I think I, I'm working on a community service project. So basically I visit um, like a, kind of an area in Southwest China every year and um, take photographs of the local people to help them fight poverty. So that is one as well. That is fantastic. Um, Rulin, are you also involved in projects? Do you also have projects in, around you? Yeah, so I think my project can categorize into like basically projects that I do for my community and then the projects that I do academically. So for example, a project that I do for my community is that um, I do journalism with a bunch of other, so I'm ethnic Korean, but I'm born in China. So I write a journal for our family history and um, the ethnic Korean identity from like the Generation Z spiel. I know it sounds kind of boring, but it actually is kind of cool. <laughs> So um, the academic <laughs> project, very cool. <laughs> thank you. Very cool. The academic project is um, that I take English notes for Chinese ethnic Korean books so that um, the people that are doing ethnic Korean re researches in America are able to access those resources. Okay, fantastic. And so as you think about those great examples that we just heard from both of you, think about what makes a project how would you define just a project? What makes a project different from just waking up in the morning and doing some work? When is a project defined as a project? And when is a project just, mm, I have a long list of things I need to do today and I'm ticking away at them. How do you know when you're actually actively engaged in a project versus when you're not? Well, it turns out there are some very specific features that allow us to characterize projects that are different from other types of work. And you'll see that it's going to be really important to identify those characteristics of what makes a project the definition of a project versus just regular routine work, waking up, eating breakfast, walking the dog. Maybe some of your homework is this routine project. Maybe uh, uh, some of your um, uh, maintenance of your room is routine, pro routine activity versus an actual project like translating a book or engaged in a specific community project. It turns out that what's really important about a project is that it's temporary. It has a start and a finish. If you cannot think about when the project is over, it is probably not a project. So projects have a start and a finish. Another specific feature that characterizes projects versus anything else or other kind of work is that it has a specific deliverable. At the end, you can say that you've handed over or that you've created a unique product that can be a book, that can be a set of presentations, that could be an event, that can be a, re a research paper, but it has to have a deliverable and it has to have a start and a finish. Sometimes we also think about a project as something that has a specific set of resources, your time, maybe some other, a group of people that you collaborate with, maybe some money that you have, like $1,000, $2,000 to invest in a project, that will be a project. And it is really important to remember because as we define projects and as we think about what makes projects so hard, you'll realize that you're constantly having to satisfy all of these things. You're gonna to have to develop a piece of a deliverable, some kind of goal, some kind of piece of work. You have a specific timeline to do that and you have a certain amount of resources. 
So let me give you a couple of definitions of what, of what is a project. And these are like formal definitions. So one definition is that a project is a temporary endeavor. So it's temporary. It doesn't last forever. Undertaking to create a unique product or service. And I think the project that you both mentioned kind of fall into that definition. Another more detailed definition, but again, it's similar kind of set of principles that a project is a unique process consistent of a set of coordinated activities with a specific, a specific start and finish, pursuing a specific goal with constraints on time, cost, and resources. Now, some projects might be more similar to the other, but Overall, you always have to think about what is unique about this specific project that you're faced. What is different? When does it start? When does it finish? So it's not an ongoing set of activities. So far, does that make sense? Is that clear? Okay, good. Because projects are defined in this way, because this is what makes a project, you know, the folks here in this call are very entrepreneurial in nature. You guys are thinking of either uh, activities and getting involved in creative ways. You might be thinking about your own products. You might be thinking of coming up with a new app. You might be thinking of coming up with a new uh, uh, social network or some kind of new line of clothing. You might be thinking about opening your own business. Each one of those things could be considered a project. When you are focused on a project and you're thinking, how am I going to be successful in this project? Project success is determined by three attributes or three dimensions, okay? What are these dimensions? The dimensions that we think about project success are exactly based on the definition. So we think about the scope. Did we actually deliver product? at the quality that we wanted? Is the customer satisfied? Is the, um, are the publishers of the book uh, happy with our translation? Did I deliver a set of great speakers? Those are the deliverables, that's the scope. I measure, do I fulfill the scope? Then another measure of project, project success will be determined by the deadline. Did I meet the timeline? Then finally, I think about the cost. Did I spend, did I overrun? Did I have to borrow more money? Did I work 24 hours a day and at night and kind of use my resources in an inefficient way? These are three dimensions. Sometimes people call this the holy trinity of project management. These are the three dimensions that I'm constantly caring about, I constantly worry about, and I constantly monitor as I think about my projects. And so maybe as I'm saying this, and you're starting to realize what makes project management so tricky. Project management uh, becomes very, very tricky because these three um, dimensions, these, this holy trinity in project management is actually very hard to satisfy simultaneously. And why is that? Well, let's assume that things are running late. I'm trying to organize um, a project and my activities are running late. I notice that I'm running out of time. What do I do? Well, I can probably typically do two things. I either start cutting out stuff from the scope, so I reduce the scope, so I'm trading off scope in order to meet my timeline, or sometimes I can throw more money at it. I can hire more people. I can ask, a, you know, I can ask another developer to help me. And so in order to meet my timeline, I have to spend more money or I need to cut the scope. Uh, another way to think about it is sometimes I have scope creep. I start doing a project and then it becomes more and more complex. In order to satisfy my scope creep, it will typically take me longer to fulfill my project or it's gonna end up costing me more. So these three dimensions are never independent. They're always codependent and always my success on one of these dimensions affects my ability to satisfy the other two dimensions. So when you're starting a new project, and you're getting some clarity from working with your team or with the company or with the boss or with your professor, you're getting clarity on what the scope, the time and the cost is, you need to identify which of these three dimensions is the most important. They're never of equal importance. There's always gonna be one dimension that is more important than the other two dimensions. And if you don't identify that, your whole project is gonna be much harder to succeed in and your chance of failure will go up.
because you need to make decisions all the time. You're going to have to decide, do I spend more time on an activity? Do I bring in more people to work with me? Do I um, add more features to my app or maybe add another speaker to our seminar series? The more you want to make decisions, you have to think about which dimension is the most important and which dimensions can I, what, uh, what I tend to call, compromise on. Where do I have some room to compromise? Where do I have some room to, uh, to make some decisions? And how am I going to make the decisions every moment of my project? And so all three of these dimensions, while they're, all three of them are important for project success, there is a way to prioritize them to say, okay, in this project, I care more about the time or the cost. And I'll give you some examples. So a framework that I often introduce to my students that is very useful is to think about the three dimensions, time, scope, and budget, and think about, am I constrained by this dimension? Do I need to optimize or do I need to compromise? So let's do a little exercise. Everybody think about a project that they're engaged in. Think about what that project is. What is part of the work that you're trying to accomplish and say to yourself, what are the implications of being late? What are the implications of running over budget? What are the implications of uh, not fulfilling my scope? And then you'll start to identify which of these dimensions is more important. Let me give you a few examples. And I saw Trevor has a question in the q and I'll get to that in a moment, Trevor. Let me um, give you an example on how to use this framework. So for instance, let's imagine that you're organizing an event, okay? Like for instance, um, a conference for the PI organization, okay? When you organize an event like the Olympics or a sporting event or, um, uh, or, or a conference, typically in those situations, the time is really constrained. You have a date, everybody's gonna show up and if stuff doesn't get done by then, it doesn't matter, meaning it's gone, the work is gone. So when you have an event that you're organizing, time, let's see if I can use my annotation tool here. I'm not sure that it will allow me. Um, in those circumstances, when I have an event that I'm organizing, in those circumstances, then typically I would consider time to be the constraint. And I would typically compromise on scope and compromise on budget, meaning I will typically not you know, I would take out activities and I'll say, you know what, for this event, we won't have everybody um, eating the most fancy food, or we won't have five speakers, we'll only have three speakers, or we won't have uh, five different panels, we'll only have one. You compromise on scope because you ran out of time. The conference is coming up and you got to execute on the day that you specified. But there are some other projects in which these priorities are different. So for instance, if I'm developing um, let's say I'm developing the vaccine for COVID, okay, a project that a project, a very important project that a lot of pharmaceuticals around us are busy with right now. In that case, which of these dimensions, if I'm developing the, the new vaccine for COVID, which of these dimensions is constrained that I cannot miss? I'm pausing to let you guys think about it. Well, in that circumstance, I would say that the scope is the one that is, that is really, so Raul, uh, Raul is going for all three, but actually scope is really constrained. It's gonna take me longer. I'm actually, yes, I'm gonna do it as soon as I can. So I'm optimizing on time, but it's actually gonna be, it's, it's not constrained because it's gonna have to take as long as it takes until I actually develop the drug. So the scope is constrained. I'm gonna optimize time. And I'm going to spend as much money as I need. I'm going to definitely compromise on my budget in order to make sure that I fulfill my scope. And so it's clear that there is a, a prioritization here that I'm constrained by my scope, but I'm going to compromise on my budget and I'm going to try and do it as soon as possible. So I'm going to try and optimize on time. So you see that depending on the nature of the project, these objectives are not equally important, but I typically find an, at least one, at least one dimension on which I can compromise. Okay, I'm going to go to Trevor's question. So I'm going to pause you for a moment while you all digest that, and I'm going to go to Trevor's question. Trevor asks in the Q&A, does a project always need a required plan before one starts a project? Sometimes you don't really know. There's a lot of ambiguity when you start a project, and so it's not really clear what that plan is going to look like. Trevor, that's an excellent question. 
as we progress through the talk and towards the end of the talk, I'm going to spend some time introducing different methodologies. And the different methodologies will cater to the different circumstances with which you find yourself. So there are certain project management methods that are very good when you know the scope of your work, when you can plan everything in detail, and I'll show you those. But there are other methods that allow you to uh, progress and get started even when you don't have that much um, clarity or that you're not 100% certain on exactly what the scope of the project will entail. So I will demonstrate, I will give you examples and a flavor of the different methods, and I will show you how those methods fit the different circumstances with which your project um, is, faces, is facing. Um, then, um, so hopefully, Trevor, that answered your question. Um, I will uh, move on to the next one. Uh, Rena asks, um, for the three project objectives of scope, time, and budget, um, will one um, also um, easily affect the other? Um, and it is, it is indeed the, the case that they are all interconnected. They are rarely, I've never seen a situation where they are totally independent. So cost and budget and how much money you spend typically affects the quality, not always in a linear fashion. So not always, more, not always more is better or more cost is more scope. Sometimes they can have a, a, a negative relationship, but they are connected and they do affect each other. And then finally, um, Yiying has a question around um, which of these three dimensions is maybe most relevant to entrepreneurs. And thank you for asking that question. That is an excellent question because it does bring uh, to, uh, it does make a very important point that in the context, and so let me kind of go back to my slides here and, and I'm gonna um, erase, I mean, pick my eraser. In the context of, will it let me erase my example? Yes. In the context of uh, entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurial activities, actually in the context of entrepreneurial activities, typically I would say from my work with a lot of entrepreneurs, it is typically the case that budget is constrained. Once you run out of money, you typically have to shut down your startup and you have to, or your entrepreneurial venture, and you typically walk away. And so you're typically working with a very limited budget. You're trying, you're typically going to compromise on your scope a little bit, maybe optimize it to some degree, but you're trying to get a proof of concept, an MVP, right? A minimum viable product. You're trying to get something within the money that you have before you run out of money to allow you to raise more funds and grow. So it is typically the case that in an entrepreneurial setting, you typically are constrained by your budget and you are trying to um, do as much as you can on the other dimensions, bearing in mind that once you run out of money, you are going to uh, struggle to progress. How are we doing so far? Are we good? Is this helpful? This is just the basics. We're just getting warmed up here. Um, thank you for the questions and keep those questions coming. And, um, and hopefully this is, uh, this is helping um, you all. Um, so let me move on to, to, and let me progress this a little bit to give specific frameworks and to be even more uh, concrete with, with, uh, with what I'm describing here. Okay, so we talked about the objectives. We talked about the fact that we always have to trade them off. And we spoke about the fact that not one of these three dimensions or not all three of them are gonna be equally important, but there's always gonna be one of these three dimensions that is more important than the other two. So when we start a project, when you start, when you're sitting down and you're saying, okay, I have a new project that I'm about to engage in, I highly encourage you to spend, it doesn't have to take long. This can be a half an hour, maybe an hour top, a little part of your time focused on just sitting down and writing out on a piece of paper, what is your project definition? It's a step that we typically skip. We typically like to get into the plan. Everybody likes a Gantt chart. We like our calendar. We like to get into the detail. And so we skip this kind of fundamental phase of sitting down and writing out our project definition. What is our goal? How are we organizing the project? What are our scope, time, and budget? How are we going to trade them off? Which is more important? And make sure that you are clear on how this is all going to evolve so you walk into the project with a clear prioritization and that if you are working with other, um, there are other parties, other parts of your organization, other individuals, other students, professors, um, teachers, uh, your family, um, the community, if there are other um, stakeholders 
that are involved in your project, you want to make sure that there is full transparency and everybody agrees on how this project is defined and where you're headed. So it's a small exercise, but it's hugely valuable. And it is one that will pay off really quickly once you have it in front of you. People will find it very useful and you will go back and back and keep on revisiting um, it, th this project definition as you progress. Okay. Um, once you've done that, once you've done that, once you've defined your project and everybody's on the same page, now let's think about and let me share with you some thoughts about Project management in general, before we go back and talk about more tools. So when we think about project management, you know, this is part of my career. I'm a professor. I do my area of expertise is project management. And there's a really sad part to it, um, or it's kind of dramatic, I would say, that project management and project performance has a bad rep out there. If you open a newspaper, if you're reading a newspaper, if you're looking or talking about projects, people will often share with you how bad things can get. They'll tell you about a project that got delayed or a project that got canceled or a project that totally messed up. There are some examples in these headlines here that are examples of projects that take longer. Olympics are notorious. They always cost more. They are never finished on time. We don't know if Tokyo uh, 2021 is gonna happen next year, but they've definitely exceeded their budget. And COVID was the biggest uncertainty that they faced in that project um, uh, implementation. And so projects have a really bad rep and you can easily, easily in one afternoon, make a list of all the examples of projects that you can think of that have gone wrong. And so the question is, and one question that I would like you to, to kind of think about is why do projects fail? You know, there's this very, sophisticated set of tools that I'm about to show you. And there's a rich history in terms of like people focused on project management and it's a discipline that existed for 40, 50 years now. And yet projects fail all around us all the time. Well, there's an interesting phenomenon um, that is important for us to know. And this is gonna talk a little bit about um, the psyche or the, the human parts of project management. There's an interesting phenomenon that psychologists have studied in many different ways that is called the planning fallacy. This planning fallacy, what does it mean? It means that we as individuals, when we start a new project, we typically underestimate how long things are gonna take us and how much they're gonna cost. And maybe you're all smiling saying, oh, I've done this before, I've underestimated. And I found myself really scrambling at the last minute. Individuals and firms routinely overpromise and under deliver. They typically think things will take them faster and that they will cost less money. And probably if you, you know, those books and your translations or your research projects for school or your community projects, things typically take longer. And so I wanted to kind of share with you some ideas on why this is, because it's very relevant to entrepreneurs and it's important to keep in mind all of these different effects that could, um, you know, influence you and your ability to succeed when you start a project. I'm also going to make it clear how some of these tendencies can be overcome with the right project management tools or the right project management techniques. And by the way, I'm talking a lot and there's a lot of great ideas, I hope, that you're taking from this. Um, and I wanted to make sure that you know that A, I think the, pro the whole session is being recorded so you can go back and watch it, but also I'm gonna share my slides. So if you wanna go back to an idea that I spoke of and I kind of moved beyond, you can take the time to go back and, and take a look. I'm covering a lot of material in this very short um, uh, talk. Okay, so why is it that we as individuals and as companies suffer from what we call the planning fallacy. Where does that come from? What are some of the reasons that it happens? Um, well, there are many different reasons that we suffer from the planning fallacy. One reason that we suffer from the planning fallacy is something called Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law says that whatever time you're given for a task, you will typically fill it up. If you were told that you have, let's say, a week to do a piece of work or a month to do a piece of work, you will rarely finish early. And so everything expands as much as it can, and sometimes it goes beyond. So for instance, 
Imagine you're working on some kind of project for school. And imagine that you thought that it would take you, let's say, three weeks to do. And you were given by your teacher five weeks or by the professor five weeks. Three weeks of work, five weeks to do. What happens? Well, typically, you're going to take all the five weeks. You're not going to finish early. You're not going to submit early. You're going to spend the five weeks. And maybe, you know, under the best case scenario, you'll add another chapter or you'll do more. You'll add the scope. You'll make it instead of an A, an A plus. But at some point, there's going to be diminishing return. So you're going to fill up the work to the point where you're going to suddenly start to realize that you might be risking going late. So we have this kind of phenomenon called Parkinson's law that expands the work. So if you think that some of the things will happen fast, they rarely do. So that's the first um, reason why projects fail because things always take as long as they're expected and maybe even longer. There are interdependencies along the project. If one task takes you longer, typically other tasks will take you longer too. If you're organizing an event and you have three speakers and it took you longer to get the first speaker, it is very likely that it's going to take you just as long, if not longer, to secure the other two speakers as well. Then we have the famous student syndrome, which may be very close to some of you, some of you in terms of your, your, your habits. And it's called student syndrome in project management. That's the formal, that's the formal title for procrastination. What does that mean? If you have a project or an assignment for school that you think is going to take you three weeks and you're given five weeks to do, when do you start working on it? Most of us start working on this in week three or four. We delay it and we delay it and we delay it until exactly the last minute because we think that we're overconfident and we procrastinate and we wait until the end and then we start working on it by which it's probably too late because if anything uncertain comes up, if anything you know, affects us in terms of uh, our project and our ability to execute on it, we're already too late because we've procrastinated. We've delayed it until the last minute and therefore we end up again having to write our teacher or professor to say, we're running late um, uh, uh, be just because we sat on it and we didn't start immediately. So there are some effects. Let me give you, uh, or some of the reasons why we suffer from the planning fallacy. Let me give you another example of something that we all suffer from that has severe implications for how we execute. When we're given a task that we think is gonna take us three weeks and we're given five weeks to do it, so we have plenty of time, what we typically end up doing is maybe, maybe, start, maybe not all of us procrastinate the same and some of us do start to work on it, but then we get distracted and we're like, oh, I have plenty of time, so I'm just gonna go and play a game. I'm just gonna go and read a book. I'm just gonna go and chat with my friends. Or I'm just gonna go and work on another assignment for a different course. So what we typically end up doing is we end up, most of us, many of us, we end up multitasking. What happens when we multitask? Here's an example. We have three tasks here. Task A should take me 10 days. Task B should take me 10 days. Task, task C should take me 10 days. But we have very little attention span and we get bored and we think that we have plenty of time. So we say to ourselves, let's start mixing and matching. Let's do a little bit of A, a little bit of B, a little bit of C. We can tell all the teachers and all the professors that we've done a little bit of each and then we will um, go back and forth. So what sometimes we say to ourselves is not attempting to progress half of A, then half of B, then half of C, then go back to A, B, C. So we start cycling through it. And this happens to everybody, not only students, it happens to people in the workplace. They want to make sure that they're progressing all of it. I know that I'm working on several papers with co-authors, and so I work on a little bit of one, tell them that I've done something, then I work on a little bit of another, tell my co-authors I've done something, then I work on a third. You know, we jump around. But there are severe implications for multitasking. When we multitask, if I execute half of A, then half of B, then half of C, and then I go back, even if I'm perfect in the transition, what do we see? Notice what happens here. We see immediately that task A, B, and C in totality now take 20 days instead of 10. So every single task now doubles the amount of time that it's on my desk. While I'm not actively working on it, it's still being on my queue, on my list, on my to do thing, my to do. Another thing that we notice when we multitask is that B and A are both late. I could have finished both of them earlier 
if I stuck to my original plan. So I should have finished a uh, around after 10 days. I should have finished here. I should have, should have finished B after 20 days. And yet A is only going to be finished after 20 days. And B is only going to be finished after 25 days. So everything took la later. C was finished on time, but the uh, overall elapsed time that it is in the system is longer. And so multitasking, by doing the same amount of work, just splitting it into small tasks, basically double the amount of work that I have under my header, which adds a lot of pressure and stress and the sense that I'm constantly juggling too many things. And I'm constantly juggling too many things because partly I did it to myself and I split my attention as opposed to finishing something and sending it off. Okay, great. Keep the, the questions coming. Great questions. Question is, um, and uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing Zenzen's name correctly. With the planning fallacy, will companies deliberately estimate longer times uh, than they actually need before starting the project? Um, so it's interesting. The planning fallacy is partly psychological. So the, the phenomenon that I've described, Parkinson's law, student syndrome, multitasking, optimism, um, overconfidence, these are all kind of like cognitive psychological effects. But to Zenzen's question, there are a lot of also reasons why there's a planning fallacy because of more strategic reasons. Sometimes I wanna get the project, I'm bidding for a project, I want them to choose mine, so I actually go low. I say it's gonna take me faster and cheaper just to get in the door. Sometimes I um, am competing and I wanna make sure that I get the project and not somebody else. So there could be strategic reasons why companies actually end up having the plan fallacy because I just tried to get my project through. So how do we overcome? The good news is there's plenty of ways to overcome. The good news is, is that there are lots and lots of things that you can do to make your projects execute faster and properly and not have as much planning fallacy to have more accurate and realistic plans. First, keep an eye on your data. Look at how well you did in the past. If you're at school or if you're doing some kind of program, think about all the previous assignments that you've done. Think about how well you did then and how, many, how close you got to the deadline. Try and adjust your estimation based on historical performance. Use some buffers, give yourself some slack, give yourself some extra space um, on the timeline. Use small teams, dedicated teams that can work together, have small tasks. Think about deliverables on a weekly basis, on a daily basis. Don't plan you know, large chunks of work. Plan a chapter at a time, not a whole book at a time. And work together as a team. And let me make that even more concrete. So back to our planning, project planning and management framework. We've done the definition, we've defined the project, now we're, detail, now we're into the, the planning. And we wanna make sure that we plan well so we don't suffer from the planning fallacy. And so in order to do that, we can go down this kind of list of all the things we need to think about. We need to make sure that we think about the scope. What is going into the project? And I'm just gonna show you some pictures here. These are images of brainstorming sessions, but the goal is to think about all the work. This is an example of a project that I was involved with that had to do with um, uh, starting a new facility for producing juice, fresh uh, uh, pressured juice. Um, and we thought, first we started by listing all the different activities. We spent a laundry list, you know, on the board, all the different activities. Make sure that you have the scope right. And this goes back, so it goes back a little bit to Trevor's question. See how detailed you can get if you have a good sense for what the scope of the project is. If you don't, don't worry, Trevor, I'm going to come back to even more some tools on situations where you're, the answer is, I don't know what the scope is. If you do, you can continue. If you have a good de detailed scope of the project, you can continue and you can put together a detailed plan. So this is, again, just some visual tools of the scope. This is called the work breakdown structure. It's a way to show people what the scope of the work is. And then from having the, the detailed scope of the work, then you can come up with the actual detailed plan by listing out all the activities. And this is a small example. These are all baby examples. You say for each activity, how long will it take? How, in days or in, in months? You kind of make a list of all the durations and you think about the dependencies. And what do I mean by dependencies? For each task to be done, what has to have been done sooner? What is you know, projects are not just a, a sequence of activities, but there is actually dependency. Some activities could be done in parallel. Some activities have to be done on their own. 
And so you want to be thoughtful about your different activities and you want to say to yourself, which can I start immediately? which have to wait for other activities to be done. And you're starting to get a sense for the richness of the relationship between your various tasks. These precedence relationships are at the heart of every project. This allows you to describe every project that you're kind of executing or working on. You can actually kind of look at it like it was a network, a network of activities that flow into the other. This is a translation. So here's the information in a table format. Put it into what we call a network diagram. Put the, the relationships between the activities in such a way that it's easy for you to understand where you start and what the flow is of the activities. That will tell you if you are an individual that is involved with a task that is only appears later on, you can't even start with it right now. So you're going to have to pace yourself. Another thing that this allows you to do, and by the way, if any of you have ever used a tool, a software tool for planning projects like Asana or Microsoft Project or Smartsheet, all of those tools have this built into it. They have an automatic way to draw the network diagram and to use this information to come up what we call um, to come up with what we call the critical path or the longest path in my project. If I look and identify what is the longest set of activities in my project, that will tell me the fastest time my project can be finished in. That is called the critical path. That is a time-related component that tells you at the very minimum, when will you finish your project? What is the fastest you can finish your project? So the fastest you can finish the project is the longest path in your project. And you can do this either by eyeballing it if the project's not big, if the project is larger and it has hundreds of tasks, MS Project or Asana or any of these tools can give you this critical path for you. And there are ways to automate it. And I'm not going to get into the technicality of how to calculate it, but it's fairly straightforward to come up with the set of activities. And in red, you see it here. This is an again chart in the MS Project, the set of activities that form the longest path possible. And these are tasks that you have no slack meaning you have to start them on time. The other activities, the ones that have slack in them or, or float or wiggle room, those are activities that you can postpone. So, you know, some of us do this intuitively. Some of us, when we, let's say, I'll give you an example from a project that we all engage in on a regular basis, on a daily basis. When we cook a dinner, when we cook a meal, we typically, my daughter, I have a, a, a young a daughter, a 10-year-old daughter, she's fantastic at this. She knows which way, where to start. Do I start with topping the onions? Do I start with uh, uh, warming up the oven? Or do I start with working on the patties? Well, it depends what takes the longest. And so that critical path is where you, it tells you what to start and what you really have to make sure that you progress. Then you can focus on other things or multitask if you really have to, or you can kind of spend the other resources while your critical path is progressing. Because if your critical path gets delayed, your whole project will get delayed. And so you really want to use this again to prioritize the tasks that you're working on to make sure that you're going to finish your project on time. So We've talked, I've talked about a lot. You're planning your project. You've listed the scope. You've come up with your durations. You've come up with your rest relationships and your precedents. You've come up with the critical path. Now you're getting a lot of clarity on everything that you have to do. And it's going to make your life much easier when you sit down to make decisions and you actually execute your project. Keep those tasks as short as you can. That will help you overcome the planning fallacy. Keep them as small as you can on a weekly basis to allow you to not be distracted or multitask. All of this is coming together, hopefully. Um, a small note, I won't spend too much time on this, but there are tools out there to also help you manage your risk. If you're conducting a project, especially if it's a project that is really important to you, if you're writing a thesis or if you're doing a really big, important piece of work, if this is a project that is going to take longer, but it has important implications. If you're applying for colleges or schools or, or grad schools, or if you're applying um, or your company's uh, doing a project um, that is going to either, you know, secure the next big client for your company, all of these very important projects, you may want to spend at least an hour or two thinking about all the risks that you face. 
For instance, COVID is a risk and companies that spend some time having agility or having a backup plan were better placed to deal with it. So list the risks that you face and list all the things that could happen and what you're going to do if they happen. So you have kind of a backup plan. So that's just a plug for, for risk management as part of the process as well. Oh my goodness, there's a fantastic question here. Uh, perhaps by somebody who knows me or, or, has, or kind of senses where I'm headed. There is a question around the wisdom of the crowd and how it comes into play uh, with project management. Wisdom of the crowd is a, an idea that brings together multiple perspectives. It says, if I'm gonna use um, some tools to do some forecasting, or if I'm gonna think about activities that require innovation, I'm gonna bring a group of individuals together because my outcomes will be improved by the um, uh, crowdsourcing of opinions at every phase along the way. So for instance, I'll go back here and mention a few examples. When I come up with my list of tasks in order to make sure that I have my entire work breakdown structure properly scoped out, this is an opportunity to crowdsource opinions and to have multiple perspectives of folks that um, you can consult with. If you're doing your community project, Wendy, make sure that you're taking into account all the different individuals that might be um, uh, affected by it. And that could be the organization that is planning that you're part of, that could be other volunteers, that could be the public that you're hoping to engage in. Whoever it is, make sure that they're, they're included in the, in the scoping so, they, so you make sure that everything that they're hoping for is included in the project. When you're planning the project durations, a great opportunity for crowdsourcing um, input. Uh, some companies like to call it planning poker. They sit there and they have a game of planning poker where they all play their, their cards and they estimate how long tasks will take them. And that is an opportunity for everybody to have their own opinion, but to also benefit from sharing opinion. And ultimately you walk away with durations and kind of a sense of how comprehensive the work is that is shared by multiple individuals in the organization. So those are a few examples. There's plenty of other opportunity to uh, crowdsource opinion. Um, I wanna make sure that I'm being respectful of time. Uh, I can't have a talk on project management that runs late or that runs uh, uh, short on time. So I wanna make sure that I spend the next uh, few minutes as I wrap up talking about um, um, this notion that Trevor mentioned at the beginning, when I don't have a clear sense of the scope of my work, there's a lot of ambiguity in my work and therefore I need a different set of tools. The world today, one of the more popular and common set of tools that you'll find in project management is called Agile Project Management. Agile Project Management is a set of tools that allows you to be, as the name suggests, perhaps more agile in your approach. You are progressing week to week, they call them sprint to sprint, and you choose on a weekly basis what is gonna go top of my list and what is maybe uh, no longer that important. So it allows you to kind of mix up the scope to a degree that is suitable for the circumstances that you face. And, and entrepreneurial ventures, this is incredibly important because you might start thinking, this is gonna be my product. I'm gonna develop an, an, MPV, uh, an MVP, a minimum viable product that has these features, but then quickly you're gonna realize that that's not exactly um, the, the product that you're interested in or that your customers are interested in. And so therefore you need to be nimble and kind of pivot and take it in a different direction. For that purpose, we have what's called agile project management. And I'm gonna very briefly, like in just a couple minutes, describe what this means. Agile project management is the idea that you have a list of features that you wanna develop or a, a, a kind of a sense of the scope, but it's only a list. And every week you prioritize. You move in small, small iterations. You don't plan for six weeks, uh, six months. You don't plan for a year ahead. You plan for, let's say, the next month or two. And you're saying, how will I evolve? And you have a team, and we don't have to be this formal, but there are formalities. So you have a team that includes people from your organization, multiple uh, skill sets, and typically it includes the customer. Now, customer in your terms and the project that you described could be of different kinds. Maybe it's the publishing house, maybe it's the authors of a book, maybe it's the community with which you're developing these activities for. Keep those customers as part of the team, view them as part of your team, consult with them on a regular basis, show them the progress on a regular basis. The agile approach is about working together collaboratively and progressing with the clients 
towards a common goal because you didn't know where when you started exactly the nature of the final deliverable. And so there are a lot of machinery and formalities and actual technical tools out there for agile project management. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but there is a whole set of tools. And if you like visual representations, if you like sticky notes, you can have a scrum board with sticky notes. If you have, if you like, um, automated apps. You can have an app on your phone that is your agile scrum board. You can find ways to do it. So you're keeping pro, pro, um, track of progress and you're keeping track of what you've completed. And that's how you make project progress through your project plan. Um, I want to wrap it up and I want to bring it all together. And I want to tell you that all of what I've said today, which was very fast and I kind of sped through it, all of this is um, very much rooted in theory that has been developed. And there are tools that allow you to master these capabilities. There is no expectation that you build your own project plan manually or that you do everything by hand. But there are tools out there that allow you to learn the techniques to overcome any of the kind of psychological phenomenon that we spoke about that affects the execution of the project plan and that allow you to at least start off on the best foot forward give you some tools and, and visuals to look at as you progress through the project um, evolution and in order to help you satisfy your goal. In the example of Lumi, that juice that I showed you, the fresh juice example, the, the entrepreneur, the founder of the company was a woman working with very, very limited resources. And from all of that planning activity, she walked around with a piece of paper, a single sheet of paper in her pocket with the critical path of activity. From a list of over 100 tasks, the critical path was less than 10. And she could focus, laser focus on those activities. And every time she had a vendor call her and say, we're being delayed, or it's gonna take us longer, or we don't have the right approval. All she cared about is, okay, looking at my critical path, what are the implications? Is this gonna delay me in a significant way? And she could make decisions very, very quickly because she knew how to focus her attention. And ultimately that's what project planning is all about. It's about finding the tools, to help you execute your plan in a way that will allow you to accomplish your goals. You don't want to overwhelm yourself with some of these tools and techniques to a point where you're paralyzed. You want to use selectively any part of these tools that I've talked about today to help you achieve your goal. I'm going to pause there. Um, I hope that that's helpful. I hope that that made sense. Uh, I'm happy to share my slides. I don't know if there's maybe a question or two towards the end that I can um, answer. Um, I see maybe there's a couple here. Um, yeah, uh, there's a question from Anna about time being even more of a constraint than before. Time is always a constraint, especially managers always think that you're supposed to march to the deadline. Um, from my experience, time is rarely a constraint, um, but it is one that people for the wrong reason sometimes focus on. Once a deadline is out there, everybody focuses on that kind of target date. And sometimes that's not very helpful. So having the ability to push back and say, really, what would happen if we'll be delayed? Do you really want to go to market with a bad product in order to meet this deadline? Or do you prefer to take a couple more weeks? So describing it as trade-offs is often important. And it's really kind of uh, helpful to think about the fact that time is really not always the constraint, although everybody obsesses about it. Then um, there's another question here around um, multiple projects. How can companies, you know, reduce or how does it affect their efficiency when we're running portfolios of projects? We have a portfolio of projects. Uh, we have multiple projects. We have to multitask because we're all assigned to multiple projects. That's very true. But that's why it's even more important for our supervisors or the bosses or the people in charge to set some guidelines and some prioritization because it will have a negative effect if we don't focus our attention and accomplish a certain amount of work in an allotted time. So it's really important to recognize the shortcoming of multitasking and to try and help yourself stay on task. Wendy, how did we do? 11.55? We're yep, good? On time. Yeah. Okay. Fun Fantastic. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, uh, yeah. I think we have learned a lot. Yeah. Fantastic. So everyone, thank you for inviting me so much. Yeah. And thank you for speaking with us. I think this is very helpful. My pleasure. Good luck with all your projects and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Yep. Um, so thank you, professor, for coming and thanks thank everyone you. for attending the talk.
this is the end of our talk.